Welcome to GNCC Espresso Live. My name is Mishka Balsam and I will be your moderator for the next hour. This is week seven of running the series of live webinars reflecting on the impact of COVID-19. We don't know when, maybe weeks, maybe months, but the world will move forward from this pandemic, this period in time that we're in right now. And it will be a different world where the way we think, the way we conduct business, or those aspects that shape our collective values will have been impacted by this crisis. The purpose of this series has been to look at the situation that we're in to better understand how COVID-19 is impacting our life and to start thinking about tomorrow and what decisions can be made and form the found sound foundation of our recovery. Weeks back, thousands of organizations across Niagara moved into temporary home offices, closed their locations, let go of staff, and with that, experienced a devastating decrease in sales. Some were able to move over to e-commerce platforms, while others are preparing for the reopening of their business. With all these changes, companies are unsure on how to communicate with internal and external stakeholders, and how to sell, how to boost the limited sales that they have, and how to connect with customers. In times like this, where we don't know what to say, it is imperative to communicate with customers, investors, suppliers, business partners, and employees to share compassion, show responsiveness, and demonstrate strong leadership and innovation. Today, we are very fortunate as we are being joined by two experts, Stephen Murdoch, Vice President of Public Relations at Enterprise Canada, an organization and individual well known across Niagara and who provides media and public relations counsel to a wide range of clients. And Sharon Worsley, Senior Manager with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. In addition to all the things that she does for the Ontario Chamber, Sharon has run her own business of helping organizations flood their businesses with customers and clients, and she holds a deep industry expertise, especially when it comes to tourism and hospitality. Sharon and Stephen, thank you so very much for being with us this morning. To all the participants, thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, we encourage your questions and uh, strong interaction with our pan panelists. You have two uh, options of asking questions. You will see on the right hand side of your screen the symbol of a hand. By clicking that, we know that you want to ask a question and we will unmute you. Please watch for it. And the second option is a chat window. It's a field where you can type in your question, we can see it, and we'll do our best to get to it. Lastly, over the last couple of days, we've received a number of questions that have come in via social media or email, and uh, we're going to try our best to get through all of them, and we're going to start out with one of them. Um, but let's uh, maybe just set the tone, because both of you, both you, uh, Sharon and Stephen, are in touch with businesses across Ontario, uh, across Niagara at all times. You're in regular contact with them. Let me ask you that. Can you give us a sense on how organizations in Niagara and Ontario-wide have been impacted by COVID-19? And Sharon, if I can ask you maybe to take the mic, and then I'll pass it uh, on to Stephen. Sharon? Certainly. First of all, thank you very much, Mishka, for the opportunity to be of service to you and the attendees. Uh, I not only have had a lot of conversations with individual businesses, but chambers such as yourself. In my uh, role with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, I work with over 135 chambers and boards of trade. So they, along with their members, are letting us know of the different challenges that are occurring. Uh, so I think that, you know, Pretty much every business out there has been impacted in some way, whether it be uh, having to lay off staff or they're solopreneurs and they, uh, they feel that they have no customers or clients right now. Uh, overall, every industry has been impacted in some way. I see that the government is, uh, is whether you're um, you know, pro one um, type of, of uh, politician or another, collectively from where I sit in my role and just as a voter, I see that the politicians are learning a lot more about the different industries that are out there and the different businesses and often their individual needs, which they may not have realized before. But ultimately, I think that the overall message is we're all in this together. 
Yeah, and I appreciate that. And I think we've heard this, uh, especially over the last uh, two months, uh, that I think everyone is appreciating, A, the responsiveness of all levels of government in trying to help out individuals and business organizations. And then the second part of it is the collaboration that we see. It seems like party politics has moved slightly to the side uh, and we're seeing a collaboration um, that really does uh, support your point that you made, Sharon, that we're all in this together. Um, Stephen, what has your, what's your sense of uh, what is happening uh, in Niagara, maybe specifically, but also across Ontario? Uh, thanks, Mishka. Thanks to you and your team for having me. Uh, I, I echo Sharon's sentiments. It's, uh, it's been inter interesting times to say the least. Uh, our agency does a lot of work, uh, both here in Niagara and across Canada, and, and certainly every industry has been impacted in some way. Uh, we do a lot of work in the tourism industry, hospitality, the wineries, breweries, and things across the board. Uh, and, and they really have been decimated, to put it bluntly. And it's been great to see the government uh, step, uh, step forward and, and become nonpartisan and put politics aside and focus on growing businesses. Uh, it's, it's been more interesting for me to see the in ingenuity and how businesses in Niagara and across Canada have pivoted, um, specifically the restaurant industry. I give them a lot of credit uh, how they've been able to curbside, turn to curbside quickly, gift cards and things of that nature. So uh, it has proven to me that Canadian entrepreneurs are a, a resilient bunch, a very smart bunch. And... Um, it, it, it's be, it'll be interesting. I think specifically some industries here in Niagara, obviously tourism is a big part of our, our, our economy and it's probably one of the industries that'll be hardest hit long term. And so it'll be interesting to see how that industry will be able to rebound. Uh, my guess is for folks that, that are specifically in that industry, you're going to start to see them focus their marketing efforts and communications efforts within a three hour radius. Yeah, I think we've heard the, the same as well. We had, uh, even with some of the ministers of economic development and others, especially those that are focusing on tourism, they looked at the same way. They looked at and saying like, where can we grow internationally for tourism? It will be more difficult, uh, but locally um, and closer to home, people still want to go somewhere in the summertime or in the fall or this year, whenever the time is right. Uh, and where can they go and feel safe, uh, safe to go? So thank you both uh, for that. And just said, the tone um, of the uh, of this conversation. So more and more people are working uh, at home, working from home, and they're paying more attention than ever to the news, social media, blogs, and videos. Experts say communicate, communicate, communicate. What are the best ways at these times for businesses to reach out to clients, to customers, and uh, vendors? Stephen, if I can ask you maybe to take it first. Sure, that's a good question. I think today you really want to focus your efforts on reimagining what your business engagement is going to look like for tomorrow. That's really what it comes down to is uh, depending on the sort of business you're in, we might still be four or five weeks from you being able to uh, to to actually welcome people into your business and 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 do sales. So I think when it comes to communication specifically is uh, two things. you You want to understand who your audience is and then how to get to that audience. Uh, and who knows your audience better than you? Uh, and and the heart of what we do as communicators is is what I call storytelling. Um, it's it's telling the, the the stories of the people that work within your organization and what actually makes your business uh, tick. And so, uh, depending on what your goals are, if you're to communicate, over communication is certainly it, it can become fatigue. We all we all laugh at the number of new e newsletters that we get in our inbox all the time. But I think it's really finding that sweet spot of doing uh, the right mix of media. Related relations, uh, email, email marketing, social media, and, and finding what that is. And, and the reality is it's, it's uh, trial and error. And so this is a time, if, if your business is not as busy as, as it could be, it's a great opportunity to look at, uh, do, a, do a quick communications marketing audit. Look at how you're communicating with your audience now. Is your website up to par? Are your social media platforms up to par? Do you have relationships with the media in your, in your neighborhood and things of that nature? Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate especially the point of the audit because sometimes in everyday business we get so busy that we don't stop. And so we, uh, we use the same message, message that we had yesterday and thinking it's going to work for us tomorrow. And maybe this is really not the time where it, it won't um, and it can't. Sharon, your, your thoughts on it? So I agree with Stephen. It's important to do an audit of what you're doing and it should extend to all areas of your business not only communication, but just 
in everything that you are currently doing or were doing before we had to shut down to see if there are certain things that you could do differently moving out uh, and getting back into business. Um, things like, you know, how much do you empower your staff to take action in different matters? So give you an example, I worked for a hotel for 13 years as a senior sales manager, and our front desk were allowed to spend up to $40 to help a, a, a new guest coming in. So say they arrived and it was four o'clock, which was check-in time, and they uh, the room wasn't ready because maybe the night before we had a big convention in the, in the hotel and so our our staff were quickly trying to get the rooms ready so they they were authorized to say spend forty dollars to send the guest maybe to the restaurant to have a drink on behalf of the hotel or do something like that or send a wine and cheese plate up to their room when they finally get in so it's little things like that that you're you will be communicating so for me it falls within the communications scope the additional thing that i wanted to mention too regarding communication and knowing your your customer. Uh, I've worked with a number of companies during my career in all different types of industries as a consultant where they don't truly know who their customer really is. They know that it's, uh, you know, this person between this and this age, this gender walks in, but they don't know about them. They don't know why they're choosing their service or, or how to then tailor what their offering is to that particular customer. And then as far as the communication is concerned, I think we all agree that our inboxes are being flooded right now, often on a daily basis by some businesses. So I, I take the contrarian kind of viewpoint of when everyone goes left, you go right. And as an example, again, when I was in the hotel industry, uh, I was mentoring a new sales manager that had no experience in sales. She had moved up through the ranks in the hotel. And one day we were having a conversation about some clients. And I said, well, what have you heard back? And she said, well, they haven't returned my email yet. And I said, well, pick up the phone. And she said, oh, no, no, you don't get it. In my generation, we don't talk on the phone. We text or we send emails. And I said to her point blank, well, that might be your generation, but who is your customer? Who is the person using your service? Are they of your generation? How will they like to be communicated to? And additionally, if they love texts or emails, just imagine you're competing with maybe 40 other hotels in the city. How will you show up differently if you're the only one making a phone call? And for me, I know as an example, when I was working for the hotel, just to give you one example, in the beginning, I had eight clients in the mining industry. By the time I left, I had over 120 clients in the mining industry. And we were an independent hotel which meant we didn't have a marketing budget at all, but we competed with all the big brands like Hilton, Sheraton, Four Seasons. But it was doing those small little things that our competitors weren't doing that allowed us to be one of the top hotels in the city. And for me, just in that one sector, I could talk about a lot of other sectors, but just in that sector to go from eight to 120 clients. Yeah, that is amazing. And I think you're bringing up some really good points. Is A, how, who do we define our customer to be and maybe it's broader than what we thought who it was yesterday um, and trying to also reach out to that and knowing that maybe our customer if we break down our customer maybe we need to communicate with them and use different methods as we're trying to reach them um, the other thing that I've always found was really helpful is to actually identify as a business who your stakeholders are because then all of a sudden you're starting to think maybe a stakeholder can be the media I've never thought of them as a stakeholder, but could be an essential one. Uh, it could be uh, your internal colleagues, uh, your staff, they are stakeholders of the organization. And it's how do we in, uh, communicate to all those different stakeholders at different times. Uh, which actually leads us to this other question that um, Anne had brought forward and asked specifically about how will COVID-19 change the way that she has to market her organization, sell to her customers and communicate with the broader audience. And that's really exactly the topic that we were just talking about. So how do they, how will it change? How will the situation change uh, us? Are we moving everything on to digital? Um, will we have l different ways of looking at it? What are you hearing? What are you seeing? Sharon, if I can pass it on to you and then we'll move on to Stephen. I think for, for now, at least, many people feel safer digitally, whether it be drive by, pick up, uh, 
at your hardware store or restaurant or so on. But I see that eventually as uh, we see a decline and more and more businesses are open, that there will be a different way of being. Now, will someone necessarily go to their massage therapist right away or you know, a nail salon or so on? Maybe they'll be one of the, the, the last businesses to open. But in the meantime, I still think you can be communicating with your clients. So uh, an example, and I, I love to give examples here and realizing that the attendees right now may not be in maybe the industry or the job I'm mentioning. However, I believe that there are lessons we can learn not only from our exact competitors, but from other businesses and industries. So as an example, my personal massage therapist, um, just before we had the lockdown, I advised her to go to the local dollar store, which I believe are still open, some of them anyway, and buy some boxes of greeting cards that had nothing written in them. And then because she was going to be at home anyway, without the opportunity to be having a business moving forward at this time, to personally write, so not you know send emails, but personally write cards to her best customers and to ensure that she actually said, Dear Mishka, thinking about you at this time. So she named the person rather than it looking like, oh, she's probably done this for 40 people. And then in the card to hand write instead of labels. So it was those little things that she could do to stand apart from people and make it more personalized. Additionally, because she is not allowed to um, consult over the phone uh, and get paid for it, I suggested that she reach out to her all her patients and say that she was available between X time and, and say nine and 12 example every day uh, during the week for like 10 minute free consults. She just wanted to have a check in with them and they could do it over Zoom or, or Skype or a phone call. So it's those little ways right now, I think that when people say to me, oh, I can't do anything because my business is shut down. I don't necessarily agree with them. And I, I do my best to show them like my massage therapist, how they can be communicating and standing apart. So think about this, if it was your massage therapist that you sent your greeting card, and in her case, she just had a baby and people would know that and think, wow, she's got a newborn and she's still doing this. When it comes time for you to use her service because she made you feel special, and I think that's the key for all business owners here or any organization, how can you make your existing customers feel special? They're more likely to refer other business to you. And I think that that's one way we'll be able to increase our business as we start opening again is through things like uh, retaining your existing uh, client base so that they're very loyal to you through your actions at this time, as well as referrals. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate also sharing your examples that you have. I do want to go for massage right now, actually, while just listening to it. But I, uh, I think the idea is uh, behind it is the personal touch, uh, you know, the direct communication and believing that that business actually knows me and is interested in, in what is happening with me and is interested in connecting with me. Stephen, the question was, how will COVID-19 change the way we market our organization and sell to our customer and communicate into a broader audience. Um, what's your take on this one? Uh, very, first off, very good question from, from Anne. Um, I, I think the reality is for a lot of brands and a lot of organizations, they certainly had to look at their narrative and look at their messaging in terms of, of how, they, how they speak to their audiences. I think if anything, with your communication now, uh, I always tell our clients, uh, the, the, I guess the, the three key words are empathy, compassion and practical so uh, be empathetic in your messaging be compassionate obviously in your messaging in your narrative and be practical in terms of, of what you can share uh, one of the examples i use we do a lot of work in the tourism industry uh, specifically with tourism attractions and tourism boards and um, a lot of them uh, reached out and said well the reality is we probably won't be opening our doors until the last week of july and i said well you know what you really can't stop communicating and you should be sharing information on social and you should be telling your stories so i, I talked a little bit earlier about the restaurant industry pivoting in the tourism industry a lot of our tourism clients uh realize that they still want to 
uh, push out good content. So what have they done? They've gone to um, virtual tourism. So uh, out in, in Stratford and in Muskoka, they've uh, quickly pivoted and decided, let's do virtual tours of what Muskoka and Stratford and other municipal municipalities have to offer. And that engages with people because they look at that media and that, that content, sorry, and will say, you know what, when this is over, I want to go there. I want to experience it. So there are a ton of opportunities as long as, again, you're not tone deaf. Um, I, I always tell people specifically from a communications perspective uh, uh, and media relations is watch the news cycle. Uh, never, nobody wants to be the first to the trough. You, you're, you're, you're slowly starting to see other stories uh, seed out about organizations as we get further into this. Uh, the reality is the news cycle is still happening, happening. So there are opportunities to tell your stories as long as it's done in the right way. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And I also appreciate your uh, three key points at the beginning of, uh, of it when you talked about empathy, compassion, and being practical about it. Um, I, I think these are really good reminders uh, to keep in the back of our mind as we're trying to actually reach out uh, and broaden our audiences and reach out to them in different ways. I think especially, I like your example also of the virtual tours because you especially see art galleries uh, and actually the whole sector of art um, having looked at that and are really utilizing uh, different ways of connecting with customers. And I think it's, it's wonderful to see. Uh, Stephen, on that question, where should businesses spend marketing and communication dollars? Should it be digital advice, social media content, e-marketing? Um, what, is, what is king right now uh, and key for any business? Well, I, first off, I think it starts with your budget. Um, you, you don't have to have a massive budget to everything. I mean, there's a lot of entrepreneurs who are really good at um, really good at social media and e, e, e marketing here in Niagara. Uh, I, I think it's a mix of, of everything, if possible. Um, something we tell our clients, obviously, uh, starting on email marketing. Email addresses, given what we're we're going through right now, are like gold. Um, you're, the ability to be able to market, especially if you sell online, uh, emails are of the utmost importance. So we're always telling our clients, look for opportunities to uh, to continue to build your email database, uh, share share information that would be of interest to your clients. Uh, also, uh, digital buys are great, depending on on where you're selling to. If you're a Niagara only business, it it's would be um, it would be beneficial to do a digital buy on the platforms, but it goes all goes back to audiences. So who are your audiences? There's nothing worse than taking a splatter approach to a digital buy and not understanding who you are, uh, who you are trying to reach. So with that, and then on obviously media relations, I think media relations is such an important tool, um, not for today, but for tomorrow, because I think it's a, it provides you with an opportunity to create rapport with uh, journalists in your backyard and journalists uh, potentially across Canada, depending on, on where you uh, on where you do business. Business. So if possible, I think it's a, a mix of all. And, and I should say uh, video too. Video is very, very important. Uh, we're, we're all fortunate that we have these cameras that uh, provide incredible video production. So if you don't have the budget to hire outside video uh, supplier, uh, you have the ability to walk around your business and tell stories of the people that work within your organization and share that content through your website, through social platforms. And um, yeah, it's, it's really endless. It depends on, uh, it depends on, on what your business is and who you're marketing to. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, there's just on social media, there is uh, Ken who wanted to ask you a follow up question. And the, the question is, you talked about that email marketing is, uh, is gold um, and the value of your email list is significant. How do you build it? Good question, Ken. There's there's a there's different ways to it. I, I always tell clients uh, when you're sending out invoices. Uh, so it depends on what kind of business you're in, Ken. But if you're sending out invoices, uh, get buy-in. If you any of your uh, pieces within your organization. Uh, by the cash register, by uh, in-store, anything in-store, uh, e email email signatures. So all of our staff at our firm in, within our, um, we have a, actually a, a daily email that's been going out around COVID-19 and sharing information. So everybody that works internally uh, shares that. They, right, in the, right in our e-signature, you can see, you know, sign up for our daily COVID updates. So so there, there are a, 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 a ton of opportunities to do it. I, it, it just really depends on, um, what opportunities you have internally to you. So I would say market internally at your business, get your staff on board. And, and what will happen is it'll organically grow. And 
as, as you provide good content, people will start sharing it more. And it's incredible. Once, once you, I've seen organizations start with an email database of, of five to 10 people and then grow into the thousands. So uh, if you're providing relevant content, it'll, it will organically grow. Yeah. And um, I think those businesses also, they're looking at succession planning and other aspects of it. Your customer list, your email list is part of the value of your organization and the strengths of your organization. So it is, as you said, it is gold. Um, Sharon, the same question actually from your perspective on it. Uh, where should businesses spend their marketing and communication dollars? Where should they go? How should they move forward in these different times? Well, I think it's important to find out where your customers are and that's where you, you go and spend your time or your money um, to, you know, bank on what Stephen was talking about. You know, it's adding value. Um, I had a, uh, I was working with a business coach as an example who was spending about $3,000 a month pre-COVID on uh, attempting to get new customers. Uh, or clients in his case. And he was working with a digital agency that was charging him $2,000 just to run $1,000 worth of ads a month. Uh, when I spoke to him, it was in week, uh, sorry, month four of him having spent $3,000 a month. Now I'm not saying the 2,000 to the agency was not a good idea because they need to be paid for their time, but he was spending $1,000 on a month, a month. And when I asked him, well, who are you targeting? He didn't know. And he found out that the agency was just blanketing targeting to anyone instead of him looking at who are my best clients? Who is it that I want to reach? Who is it that will afford my services? So essentially that money was going down the tank. To the point of email marketing, yes, it, I believe that email marketing, the money is in the list. Uh, I've got an uh, internet marketing background and that's a well-known term. The money is in the list. Um, and so the thing though, is that I see a lot of businesses losing an opportunity to build their email list with this one simple thing. Think of when you've gone to a website and they've asked for your email. They haven't asked you for it to give you something in return. They say, you know, we'll give you updates. We'll, you know, provide information, whatever, but they haven't given you, they haven't kind of dangled a carrot in front of your nose as to why you should get your email onto their list. In, in the case of thinking of your email boxes pre-COVID, they were pretty full anyway. So a lot of people may step away from giving an email list, sorry, their email address, because there's nothing in it for them. And, and Mishka, you know my, my uh, thought on this, uh, and, and I didn't create this, but it's the WIFM principle. W-I-I-F for Fred M. What's in it for me? So in everything a business owner does, and this is for any questions that we've already spoken about or any questions yet to come or businesses are thinking about, everything they should be doing should always, pre-COVID, post-COVID, in the moment, whenever, what's in it for me? And I don't mean the business owner, I mean for their customer, client, or patient. So if you're, as an example, you're a restaurant, perfect example, you're a restaurant and you think, what can I possibly give someone for signing up for my newsletter? Well, it could be you're a mom and pop restaurant as an example, and you've got this great re uh, recipe that everyone loves. Put that recipe in a document, which is very easy to do, save it as a PDF, so that when people sign up for your newsletter, they get that recipe. So you've given them something, which in internet marketing is called a lead magnet, so that they can then think, well, I want to go and uh, uh, give my email address for this. And then later on, as Stephen was talking about, give great content as well. And it's important to do it on a regular basis. I think he was talking about having an audit, you know, making sure your list doesn't go cold post COVID. You think, oh, I don't need to email anymore. No, you've built this relationship, keep it going. Yeah, I appreciate your uh, I appreciate your examples, and I think it is right that it's like we have to look through our customers' eyes and say what's in it for them. What how are they benefiting by actually becoming and partnering with our organizations that we have? Uh, Steve, back to you earlier on, you mentioned um, the that businesses have and organizations have interesting stories to tell. Do you have any tips on how to pitch a media story? Good question. Good question. Um, yes, there's, there's a, quite a few tips. I, good media relations comes down to what I call the three C's. Creativity, 
content and connections. Uh, the ability to first see creativity, the ability to come up with a good story angle. Uh, second, see content, uh, a well-written media piece that you can share with the media. And then the third, the connection, which is the relationship in the store room, uh, in the newsroom, sorry. Uh, the reality is media relations really comes down to relationships. Uh, I've, I've I've been blessed to be in the industry 21 years. So uh, I, I have, I would consider very strong relationships with media from coast to coast. And it's something I pride myself uh, on. And it, and really, it, it really does come over time. I always say to people, um, you know, you have a story and if you want to create a relationship with the media, uh, pick up the phone. And, and it's as simple as that at the beginning. If you're here in Niagara, we have a very robust media landscape with, between the St. Catherine Standard, the Review, the Tribune, Niagara This Week, CH News, CKTV. So uh, there are wonderful people that are working in these newsrooms who have to fill news cycles. And it's been interesting because people are telling me, well, I don't think it's the right time to tell my story considering what's happening with COVID. And, and you can be correct, depending on what the story is. Uh, a lot of these uh, newsrooms have been decimated. There's no doubt about it. When I first started in PR, regional newspapers like the one in St. Catharines had 15 reporters, and now they're down to five. So, and they're still pushing out the same kind of content uh, uh, on a daily basis. So it's imperative that you uh, make the effort to understand what it is they're looking for. So it's picking up the phone with a reporter and, and getting a sense of uh, what is it they cover? What beat does they cover? You can do a quick media scan in terms of, of past pieces that reporters have written and get a sense of what kind of stories they're looking for. Uh, it's been interesting because a lot of the bigger outlets, the National Post, the Globe and Mail, uh, CTV and that, actually have dedicated COVID desks now. So they have, a lot of people would know this, uh, they have COVID desks. So if you're pitching a story around specifically COVID and maybe your organization is doing something to help out in the community, that story will be pumped over to the COVID-19 desk. And they've got a list, uh, they've got a, a group, sorry, of dedicated reporters who are out telling those stories. So we have clients who do that. The example I can use is, is we, um, we're fortunate to work with Steam Whistle Brewing in Toronto, and they've been kind enough to do two things. Uh, they've pivoted and, and helped to uh, help to make hand sanitizer, but they also pivoted and are, uh, are sending, they've got a, a fleet of vintage uh, vehicles, and instead of doing beer deliveries, considering most restaurants and pubs aren't open, they are now doing delivery runs for seniors that need food. So it's a great story. It was picked up uh, by the, most of the COVID desks and went across Canada. So there are opportunities, but when it comes down to media relations, it really is uh, understanding uh, the needs of the reporter and then creating a, uh, creating a relationship with them. And, and you know, it, it just really comes down to time. It, the, the, the more you do it, the better you become at it. You know, it's an excellent point. It's even it's so timely that you're mentioning all of this because one of our attendees has uh, this question actually, and it's saying, knowing that media outlets are struggling right now and running with smaller news teams, what media outreach strategies have you found working right now? And uh, I think that is, uh, you mentioned that the team from 10 years ago uh, has decreased to a third, a quarter of what it used to be. Um, so how can businesses make it easy uh, for a media to pick up their story? Another, another really good question. Uh, you, you really have to follow the news cycle and uh, you have to you have to understand what's happening in the news cycle and what reporters are talking about uh, I, I always tell clients follow some of the reporters if you're if you're a uh, if you're a publicly traded company follow some of the business reporters on Twitter and you'll start to a lot of them will start tweeting out and sharing on their social platforms when they're looking for people to stop uh, to talk about story stories so Canadian Business Globe and Mail National Post the reporters are always tweeting out looking to talk to somebody in the restaurant industry about how they've pivoted business, looking to talk to somebody in the tourist attraction that is uh, uh, plans for post-COVID. So really following the news cycle, uh, I alluded to earlier, talking to the reporters and getting a sense of what stories that they're looking for. Uh, there's no doubt about it. it, it it's the value of earned media uh, has gone up exponentially um, because it's harder to get. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's, it's a great point. It's very difficult. Um, Back in the day, when I started in public relations, you could take a you could take a splatter approach to media relations. You could uh, you could send a, a press release or media release, uh, however you want to term it, to 600 news outlets. Sit back, and you would probably get a 35 to 40 percent return. Client would be happy, happy. You'd be happy. You'd be drinking pints at the pub by by uh, by noon. Uh, those days are gone. 
uh, those days are, are, are gone. You really have to take a, uh, a, an approach to it. It does good media relations takes time. It's creating that one-on-one -on -one rapport, getting the right content. I find for a lot of people, it, it is the content. I, I'm fortunate to work with a lot of former reporters. We have about seven, eight former reporters within our firm and we are really, uh, we really uh, make a, an, an effort to, to ensure the content that goes out of our firm is uh, is something that they could literally cut and paste in a newsroom. So you you know it, go back to earlier that content is king. It is so it's a relationship and having well written media pieces. Yeah, I agree. Anything that actually makes it easier uh, for the staff actually to take the story that it is and and being able to get it out in the news cycle that it needs to actually get out. Sharon, this is uh, one where people are asking, would love your input on it. As businesses are preparing to have some of the restrictions lifted, what can employers do to get their organization ready for tomorrow? And specifically as it relates to communication and sales, advertising messages, what can businesses do? I think that now is a perfect time to go back and audit your entire business. We talked about this at the top of the call of, you know, what is it that you were doing before? And what can you do differently, perhaps, or re re release from, you know, we're not doing this anymore. We're going to do this instead. So it could be, uh, you know, some sort of standard operating procedure for your sales department that you had before that you're, you realize it really wasn't working that well before. So let's take that off the, the table and try something different or add something onto what we were doing so that what you're, you're really doing is you're um you're taking this time to look at moving forward what do we think people will be wanting what will they be doing how will we be communicating it goes back to and stephen was even talking a moment ago about the relationship of working with reporters i think that you're going to see the biggest thing is going to be relationships how you look after people uh, a, a example i'm going to give you here is and this was pre-COVID, I was working with a financial planner who, uh, unfortunately for him, his company would not allow him to reward any people that were referring business to him. They just wouldn't give him a budget for it. So I, I came up with this idea on the spot and I said, look, what you could do is, you know, who, who are your typical um, uh, referrers? And he said, it's generally men between 45 and 60 of a certain net worth. So I said, listen, why don't you go to a local car dealership, high-end dealership, and work out a deal with them that you'll bring your referring partners to them for an evening of, of driving experience of their brand, of, of a brand new, whatever the brand might be. And it costs the person at the dealership nothing. You're not spending any money. So you don't have to worry about contravening your company's rules. And all these men will get together. They'll get to network and meet new people. They'll get a chance to test drive. And I said, and if you want to go even a little bit further, what you could do is find a restaurant in the local area that would love to get some exposure of people at this dealership uh, for the evening. And they can donate, obviously no alcohol <laughs> because they're driving, but they could donate some food. And so now you've got three businesses partnering together none of them really associated in any way with each other. However, they're helping each other to get brand awareness and to thank those referral partners who will then think this is great. And you never know that car dealership may sell an extra car out of it or at least get awareness. So I think that things like that moving forward are really important for your people to look at what other businesses can we partner with? How can we do this? And, and even to the point of someone sitting here on this call thinking, oh, that wouldn't apply to me. Well, I'll give you an example. I had a, a young um, more, uh, sorry, financial planner as well. She was 29. Her typical refers, because her clientele is usually women coming out of college and university when they get their first job to start investing for their financial future. So they would refer their other friends. Well, obviously she might not be taking them to a car dealership. So instead I suggested she go to the store Sephora. And for those of you that are not aware, especially the men, it's a very large brand, uh, not only here in Toronto, but throughout other cities. 
where a lot of different cosmetics are, 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 are sold rather. And uh, they do facials, they try on makeup and so on. So I said, go to your local Sephora, let them know what your situation is and see if they would put aside some chairs and have some makeup artists come together and maybe six of your referral partners come together, have an evening, get to chat with other women. They're trying on makeup, having a great time. Sephora is happy because maybe those people have never walked into their store again and they may make purchases on the spot. So I think that, you know, for a lot of companies of all sorts and and you mentioned the word sales, you know, those that are in sales. Here's an important piece I find many businesses miss. Every single one of your employees is in the business of sales. If it's your accountant dealing with receivables, they're still a salesperson. If it's the person at the front desk, they are in sales because they're the first line of, of uh, someone coming in and dealing with your operation. If you're a, a, a dentist, same sort of thing, whoever's answering the phone. So everyone is in sales. So I think that a company really needs to look at how they treat their customer. And for me, and, and you know me well, I don't just believe in customer service or even customer care. For me, I go the extra mile, I call it customer excellence. So I think that if you're opening up again and you're you know, trying to get business, you're gonna be competing for business from all different types of sectors. You're competing also with people that decide not to buy anything. And often businesses don't see that as a competitor, but if someone's not buying, that is a, your competition. So you have to be very creative for everybody in your company to realize they are in the business of sales and marketing and that they increase how they're dealing with their customers, clients, or patients to up-level it to customer excellence. Such important points, Sharon. I can't stress it enough. I look at businesses and so many businesses are working with skeleton staff right now, had to, you know, like let go or temporarily let go of staff and every one of our positions are changing in it. And you're right that every one of us is actually a salesperson for the organization and has to have the knowledge on how to actually be able to do it too. And I think especially as employers that we have to look at that for internal training uh, and communication. And and I really appreciate the second point that you made as well is that um, we need to more know we need to know more about our customers than just that sales transaction. This is a relationship. Find out one or two other things and continuously actually help them and assist them with it. Uh, Stephen, this one is um, is probably for you, um, or at least a, a gear, geared your way. What determines the media market radius that businesses need to focus on? So I look at Niagara, and you mentioned you know our local dailies, the weeklies that we have, the radio stations, and uh, and television and, and UTV, all the different outlets that are there. And often you might have a small business saying, "This is my market." I partially look at it. We are the Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce. I'm thinking Niagara is my market. Um, I, I don't really, but I can easily just look at it like that. But uh, what's your take on that when it comes, especially when it comes to media relations? Very simple answer. Uh, depends on what your business is. Are you selling in just Niagara? Then you focus your efforts in Niagara. I mean, there's a lot of wonderful organizations here in Niagara that, um, that market across Canada and sell across Canada. So uh, sit down, think. Well, where 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 are my people coming? Are you, if you're an e-commerce, uh, if you're an e-commerce business here in Niagara, it's endless. You can t be telling your story from uh, from Summerside PEI to Victoria, BC. If you're a Niagara specific business, then then focus your efforts obviously on Niagara. There's a if if we're focusing specific on uh, media, I, I alluded to it earlier. There's a very robust media market here in Niagara, and there are also um, there are also outlets that cover stories um, about. Niagara Niagara in Toronto. So there's been some great positive pieces on the city of St. Catharines that appeared in Food is a Magazine and uh, city of St. Catharines uh, was uh, was featured in the Globe and Mail and city of Welland was was featured in the, uh, the Globe and Mail. So uh, believe it or not, there are reporters. And I, I mean, let's face it, we're all seeing it here. I, I've spent a better part of 45 years here living in uh, living in St. Catharines and we continue to see our population grow and more people see Niagara as a place that they want to, to, to live and, and grow. Uh, so uh, there are reporters I'm noticing who are talking more about Niagara 
it, it's been interesting as I could well, obviously doing media scans, uh, a lot more reporters uh, are talking about Niagara in different ways, whether it's real estate or whether it's business opportunities. So there are, believe it or not, media outside of Niagara that are covering Niagara stories. So there are opportunities just on the highway. Hamilton's a very robust media, land, um, media market. So there's opportunities to tell your stories there. You look at CH News, they have a dedicated Niagara reporter. So there are, uh, there are opportunities, but it really goes back to who are you selling to and, uh, and who's coming through your door. And, and Stephen, with the clients that you're working with, what kind of KPIs do you put in place to say <laughs> successful in our communication here? Yeah, like well, it, it, it's a good question, Mishka. Uh, it, it all starts really, what are the business goals? What are your business goals? When it comes to key performance indicators, what are your business goals? And, and really, once you figure that out, uh, you'll, you'll get a better sense of the pulse of your company. Um, what, it, what it really KPI, KPIs come down to are the key areas that you want to improve on your business. And for everybody, they're different. They can be customer service oriented. They could be uh, profit oriented. So it's really just taking an opportunity to analyze your current business performance, how you're doing now, and then setting long and short-term business goals. And then, uh, and then figure out what success looks like, right? So starting from the top, what are your business goals, uh, both long-term, short-term, and what does success look like, and how are you going to actually measure success, right? So for us, uh, clients measure us our success on different on, on different ways for, as an agency. It can be success can be on on the amount of media coverage. Success can be on the amount of clicks. Success can be on the amount of followers that they get on social. Success could be on uh, uh, changing awareness. Uh, it, it really depends on on your organization when it comes to KPIs. One of the things that I've at least uh, noticed over the last like five to ten years, I think that organizations are being asked to provide numbers and KPIs more than ever and beforehand. Uh, and I think the same goes for the nonprofit sector uh, at the same time. Uh, Sharon, this one is, uh, is probably geared towards you. How will consumers' priorities have changed due to this pandemic? And um, how can we prepare a business for future uh, disruptions to their business? So, uh, great question. I just actually would like to just add on to what Stephen was saying. Uh, about KPIs, I think that a lot of businesses miss the opportunity to find out what's working in their marketing because they don't ask questions. So as an example, if you get someone that calls you uh, and you're in you know, a business where that's, you don't have a storefront or you know, it's through the phone uh, and you've never worked with them before, they're not asking, how did you hear about us? Or if they come into your dental practice and they're a new patient, no one's asking, how did you hear about us? So that companies and organizations can keep track of where they should be spending their time, their money, and their resources to see what's working and what's not. They could be like the business coach I mentioned before, be spending a fortune on Facebook, but that's not necessarily where maybe he should be spending his time. Maybe it's on LinkedIn, but because there's no data being kept. So I just wanted to mention that. So back to the other uh, question here, I think that Consumers are going to take a while to um, want to work with certain industries, and Stephen alluded to, and I've been in the hospitality industry, I think that that will probably be, unfortunately, one that will take a little while to come back, but it depends because uh, it will depend on the consumer and what they feel safe with. I had a call last night, as an example, from uh, a restaurant, a, a bar here in Toronto uh, that are currently closed, but he had an idea of opening it up to uh, singles dating, like, uh, you know, networking dating sort of thing. And, and uh, he was looking for my advice. And uh, I explained to him, well, first of all, it's not an essential service. So you've got to have a look on, you know, the, the provincial site as to whether you can open or not. And I said, the other thing too, is you've got to consider social distancing, because especially there's talk on when, say, restaurants open, that they'll only be allowed certain um, occupancy levels, that they will only be allowed to do certain things and, and that. And I said, now what you're wanting to do right now is to set up an evening where you've got potential dates that you're going to do matchmaking with sitting in fairly close proximity. Uh, and, you know, his, his concern wasn't even the fact that they could be fined. Um, he said, you know, that might be worth the cost of us opening and making some money. And I said, but you've got to consider your branding as well. Because say, for instance, you do this and the media picks it up 
and it puts you as a, a like the bad guys because you're not being socially responsible with social distancing it could work against you so i think that that's something that people have to be concerned with in their businesses is okay what are we going to do how are we opening our business that meets the guidelines that the government's setting out but also is in the best interests of our customers so that the customers feel comfortable so uh, an example for me i don't have a car and i if i've got to go to say the drugstore i can get on the bus and right now they're not even uh charging you if you've got cash but they're also, they've got more buses on some of the lines, so fewer people can be on. To me, that shows that the Toronto Transit Commission is considering the safety of its workers as well as its passengers to keep the, the amount of people down low so that we don't have to be concerned. And then sort of how, how the habits of consumers are going to change and, and even what businesses can be doing now one last example I'll give you is a restaurant across the street from me. I've been in this building for six years. I've never gone to that restaurant before. But about three weeks ago, I decided, you know, I want to support a local business. So I went online, saw that the, I knew that they were open because I could see the open sign. But I went on to see what the menu was. And then I called and ordered. And the woman who's the owner said, oh, and we're giving 25% off. And I said, oh, that's great. I said, um, I didn't know that. I didn't see it on your website. She said, oh, well, we have a little sign by our door that says it. So I thought, okay, great. And I purposely, instead of having it delivered, thought I need a walk. I'll walk across the street. I went and paid for it. They had a little sign against the door that you couldn't see that said 25% off. So I said to her, listen, would you be open to an, excuse me, an idea that maybe you haven't thought of before? Sure. And I said, what if you went and got a a, can, a, a, a paint can, doesn't matter what color, it doesn't have to be professional, you've got this big window, why don't you just put a big 25% off on the window? That way all the buildings across from you see it from their balconies, all the ones that are forward facing to you. All the people driving by in cars are gonna see this big sign. People walking by or on the bus getting off at the next stop see it. And then they'll know you're giving 25% off. I've still, I was by there yesterday. They still haven't, that was three weeks ago. They still haven't done it. Yet I've been by at night and seen her and her family sitting there waiting for calls to come in. So they're missing an opportunity right now. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. And that's the message I'm, I'm giving to your listeners here is whatever you're doing right now, so long as you're doing something, it doesn't have to be perfection. It's that you're getting it out there. You're showing, in this case, 25% off. She might get a little bit more business, even if it's 10 or 20% more business. I was a new customer and I've been here six years. So what's possible? Yeah, and I think you're making some good points because it doesn't have to be perfect. Look at the three of us, we're sitting in our homes. It's probably not perfect in many ways. Um, except uh, we haven't had any interruptions of kids or dogs or anything else. So, so good so far. Um, and I think the other thing is if we've ever learned anything out of COVID-19, I think it's the sense that we are community and that we actually put the best interest of the community in the greater good ahead of our own interests. And I think when we look at businesses and the examples that you gave, Sharon, uh, we will look at businesses differently, uh, those ones that are not adhering to the guidelines and others. And I think we will have stronger feelings uh, towards that. Stephen, consumers' attitudes, behaviors, and purchasing habits are changing. Will these new ways remain post-pandemic? While purchasing are currently centered on most uh, basic needs, people are shopping more consciously, they're buying local and embracing digital commerce. Will this continue? I, I certainly think it's it won't be as business as usual for the first uh, well for the while. I, I think it depends really com comes down to if there's a vaccination or something that can um, that can put an end to this pandemic. Uh, I, it certainly there are a lot of people. There, there's no doubt about it. I look at myself personally in terms of our purchasing habits. Uh, I'm I'm the type of person who um, who eats out every day or was eating out every day when I was uh, in Toronto or Hamilton or or here in Niagara, and, and obviously that's changed. Um, so and even groceries uh, groceries ordering amazon i never thought i'd be the person that would be getting a majority of my my groceries sent directly to my house so certainly in uh some things depending on what it is i, I if if um if you've been getting uh things um products delivered to your house certainly you'll probably continue that continue that i think it'll take some time even when the, my guesstimate is the last week of july um early august is when things will um 
become a lot more lax. But even then, uh, I really can't see people uh, rushing to uh, to partake uh, in activities on Clifton Hill, let's say. Uh, I, I think it's going to take a lot of time for people to feel comfortable. It certainly changed people's behavior. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but I, I think long term, my hope is that there'll, there'll be some sense of normalcy. There'll, there'll be some things, obviously, industries will change. I think the biggest industries will be travel. How we travel will change, no doubt about that. Uh, how um, how we we maybe uh, eat at a restaurant, maybe the, the spaces won't be so um, so confined, uh, so uh, on top of each other. So I think you'll see differences like that. But uh, my hope is, and, and you know, that's a question for somebody who's uh, who's in the health industry. Um, I I really believe that um, we will get back to some level of normalcy, but I I truly believe that level of normalcy is uh, at least at least five six months away. Yeah, and I, I think we've heard that same sentiment uh, from uh, a lot of other experts as well. Now, in the meantime, uh, I'd ask Sharon this question, but what will make companies more resilient to deal with future pandemics? What's your take on it, Stephen? Uh, what will make companies more resilient? Yeah. Um, I, I think for the smartest companies has really looked at this as an opportunity to learn. So um, I, the organizations that we've we've spoken to or the companies that, that we deal with through our firm, they've certainly looked at how they do their business on a day-to-day -day operations. And there, there's certainly changes that are going to happen. I, I, I always tell our clients, you really have to take the lead in the government. Uh, we, we've, um, we've been running seminars on getting back to work, and I know the Chamber's been really good about that too. Uh, but I, I, it, it really depends on the organization. But I think the smartest organizations, this is, an, this is really issues management 101 um, in terms of, of an organization. So I think for most people that we've talked to, whether they're a, um, a, a smaller business here in Niagara or whether they're a, a blue chip company that's, that's traded on the stock market, I think a lot of them are noticing uh, that they, they need things in place to deal with these issues. So uh, they're looking at uh, different things uh, across the board in terms of how they do business how how they interact with their customers how they interact with their staff so this is an opportunity uh, to look at this what I would call an issue uh, and and figure out uh, how you can do uh, business better tomorrow yeah. makes sense I can it's it's nearly 11 o'clock and we said uh, we this would be an hour-long webinar although I feel that this conversation could go on significantly longer um, but I um, I'm going to pass the mic over to you, Sharon, for some closing comments, just a minute to maybe wrap up in uh, exactly on this topic, communication, selling, marketing, uh, during the COVID, uh, post-COVID-19 times, uh, your closing comments. Right. I think that for some business owners, it's important to not feel like a victim, because if you do that, you're going to keep yourself behind. I think it's more a case of looking at reinvention looking at what you were doing before, what you're doing now, and what could be a, a pivot for the future. Things like how can you work together with other industries, and I've given examples of those, that are not your current uh, you know, uh, partners. Making sure that, for example, whatever sort of business you're in, providing it meets guidelines of, say, an association or accreditation, you have some sort of referral program set up. And you let your customers, clients, or patients know how they can be referring business to you and then how they can um, be rewarded for that. Even if it's a Tim Hortons or Starbucks card, it's something to show a thank you and an appreciation. And if people say to me they can't afford it, if someone's bringing you in a new business uh, contact or a new patient, client, whatever, whatever money they're bringing in for you that that person's worth, you can then take a portion of that and feed it back as a thank you to that partner. But now is really your time to look at, and as I stated earlier, at other industries, not just your own, to see what you can do that might be different than all your competitors are doing. And I wish everyone the best of luck getting through all this and uh, everyone stay healthy. Thank you so very much, uh, Sharon. Uh, I appreciate the thought of a, a referral program uh, and for mentioning that and bringing that up too, because uh, um, if you have good customer, great customers, they're going to be your best and strongest voices actually out there. If at any time I ever feel like I wanted to have a crystal ball, I think these times in these last couple of weeks, I wish sometimes I could look uh, five years, 10 years down the road and saying, what does the landscape look like? Uh, Stephen, your closing comments? 
first off, uh, believe in yourself. Whether you're a business owner or you're a member of a team, uh, believe in yourself. I, I echo Sharon's sentiments that uh, we will come out of this uh, at, at the end. Um, and, and thank you. I, I think there's so many great business owners and, and staff who are doing wonderful things, uh, both here in Niagara and beyond. It's, uh, it, it, is, it has been very difficult. There's no doubt about it. And, and we have all hurt uh, in some way. And, and Mishka alluded to that at the, at the very beginning, that we are all in this together and that um, your efforts are appreciated. Uh, specifically, uh, if, you're, if you're on this uh, Zoom call, uh, you don't have to be a business owner, but if you are, thank you. And, but if you're a staff member who's putting in an honest, effort every day um, thank you and I, I would encourage I would encourage folks to to lean on, on on Mishka and the team at the chamber they do great work and they've got a ton of great resources uh, uh, both on the uh, on the GR side in terms of, of working with the government but in terms of the things they have their pulse on the industry of what's happening so I would look for every opportunity to um, to work with the good folks at the chamber and just believe in yourself we we will get through this together and uh, and I look forward to seeing everybody out there Thank you so very much. Thank you for your kind words, uh, Stephen. And uh, to both of you, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Stephen, for being with us this morning. Um, you know what? I had this uh, thought of how to wrap it up, but I actually think I'm going to take both of your words and that is like believe in yourself and believe that we are all going to together make it through this. Today's webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website at gncc.ca and will be emailed to all webinar participants directly. Um, over the past um, number of weeks, we spoke of uh, a number of resources and subsidies that are available to you. For a complete list, please check out uh, our website. If you would like to reach out to any one of us directly to receive uh, our daily updates or for further questions, we can always be reached at uh, info at gncc.ca. And lastly, to all participants and attendees, thank you so very much for joining us this morning. Please stay in touch and above all, stay healthy. Thank you.